And then let's start now our city dialogue, building a new narrative. Back to normal is not the solution. We are talking about sustainable urban mobility. And I remember when we organized the first city dialogues uh, together with you, Ariana, we were looking for a definition of uh, a dialogue, right? And it's, uh, it's clear that dialogue is something that is made of, of questions and, and answers. And I already have one answer for you, Ariana. Uh, sorry, one question for you. I hope you have the answer. Sorry. I have one question. When talking about uh, this back to normal, this new narrative, why a new narrative? Well, why a new narrative? <clears throat> we are now in uh, what has been defined uh, 1.5 meter distance society and physical distancing will stay with us for quite some time, most likely until a vaccine is found. So in this new unprecedented context, the real value of uh, public space in cities became visible to more and more people living in urban areas. And uh, with cities in lockdown, people also started to realize how much space is currently unevenly allocated and occupied by cars. So people also started to realize that they were breathing better and that they could hear the noises of the bird, that noise pollution was going down and air quality was getting better. They also started to realize how much having green spaces close to their apartments and their houses matter for their physical and mental health. So in the graph, you can see these two additional crucial elements represented uh, in the health benefits and the environmental impacts. So what I'm trying to say that is that in this 1.5 meter distance society, it appears more obvious than ever how um, cities that are built around cars just are not going to work. Cars take up more space, they have close to zero health benefits and have very high environmental impacts, while active modes clearly tick all the boxes positively. And I'm talking about cycling and walking. So we obviously knew all these things already, but COVID made them more evident and also made them more evident for a wider public. So the challenge now is how do we deal with the public transport reduced capacity and act promptly to avoid a surge in private car usage? And uh, why now? Well, why now? Uh, the risk of non-intervention are huge, also economically speaking. There is this good study developed by the CISO in which uh, you can see a, um, a screenshot of one of the graphs that they develop in which even in a relatively optimistic scenario where 50% of the people go back to public transport and 50% switch to the use of the car, the cost in terms of externalities, the additional cost for society would reach 4 billion euro per year, while the cost for congestion would increase to for, of uh, additional 6 billion per year. And in the most pessimistic scenario, the one that you can see on the right side of the screen, um, where 100% of the people that used to use public transport switch to the private car, the additional cost to society would reach 21 billion euro per year, almost roughly 1% uh, of the Italian GDP. So not only investing in infrastructure for cycling and walking uh, makes perfect sense in, in terms of uh, the environmental and health benefits, it also makes perfect sense in economically speaking. And I would like to highlight one final point. Uh, there is a big momentum at the moment in cities all over Europe and all over the world, and public acceptance of uh, these measures has never been so high. So this is the perfect time to, to take actions. And there is this survey conducted by YouGov uh, on behalf of uh, Transport and Environment and the European Public Health Alliance, which uh, surveyed more than 7,500 people or in 21 la large cities in Europe. And the respondent said that I cannot, yes, 64% don't want to go back to pre-pandemic pollution levels as they experience good clean air. 74 demand protection from air pollution, even if it means reallocating public space. And 68, even if it means preventing polluting cars from entering the city center. And finally, 21% of the people plan to cycle more and, 20, and 35 to walk more after the lockdown. So 
how do we enable this? How do we transform this crisis into an opportunity? How do we build this new narrative and make this link between freedom of movement, environment and health evident for people? These are the questions that uh, we would like to discuss with you today, but we also received many questions from all the participants, from all the registered particip participants that are with uh, us here today. And I will now pass over to Juan to highlight some of these questions that we received. Yes, and already, Ariana, your introduction, your setting the scene, has uh, uh, suggested some questions from, uh, from our audience. If you already have a question, we will collect all of them and we will try to cover them later. It's only the beginning of this city dialogue. Just as a preview, let's uh, travel across Europe thanks to the questions that you submitted. Our colleagues, uh, Matilde and yourself, Ariana, are going to help us to go city from city to city. So here are your questions. Yeah. Hi, Juan. So the first question is from Julia uh, from Vienna, and she's asking what solutions implemented during COVID-19 will remain permanent? Uh, it's either the new bike lanes or the car free zones. And the next question from uh, Patrick in Stuttgart. How did you manage to plan and implement successfully temporary measure in favor of active mobility? And then the next question is from Elitza uh, in Sofia, and she's asking, how do you encourage people to use alternatives to the personal car? What are the incentives and the restrictions that you apply? And then from Silvia in Munich, what kind of best practices uh, do you know to increase the feeling of safety in public transport? One other question from Steve in Cardiff. Uh, what has been the public reaction to increased active travel provision at the expense of motorized transport? And finally, from Alexandra in Athens, what risk might be hiding in the new narrative and in the new normal that we should not ignore? Well, thank you, Matilde. Thank you, Ariana. Plenty of questions. I can also see that there is a lot of activity in the chat box, in the question box. So, Matilde, Ariana, you are now all eyes on this chat. Uh, while we will try to answer some of your questions, let's hope we, we will be able to, thanks to the presentations from uh, our three experts this afternoon. The first uh, expert we are going to say hello is uh, Patricia Reedy. Uh, she's a senior engineer in Dublin City Council. In response to the mobility challenges that uh, have arisen due to the COVID uh, pandemic, Patricia was recently appointed uh, to lead the newly created uh, COVID mobility section in Dublin City Council. Patricia, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Greetings from Dublin. I feel I'm on the Eurovision. I'm about to give my votes for some song. <laughs> and here are the votes. results of the Dublin jury. No, I'm Not totally joking. Nice, maybe, nice start. Exactly. Maybe so we, we, we have to give you the 12 points and the, at the end of your presentation. Please tell oh, us more. I love it. Those, those points, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> um, so everybody, hello. It is nice and sunny here in Dublin and I'm delighted to be able to come here today and talk to you about, uh, I suppose, uh, the bomb, the COVID bomb that went off in all our lives uh, since uh, March of this year. Um, as Juan said, I'm a senior engineer in Dublin City Council and I'm currently heading up the uh, COVID mobility team. And that was set up uh, to do with um, as a response to the COVID pandemic. Our task is to get the city back to work, optimise mobility and ensure that physical distancing is also obtained. So without much further ado, I'm going to start straight in to our my presentation. So just to start, uh, similar to some of the other 43 cities that are here today uh, joining this conversation, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on mobility in Dublin City. And you can see it there in the photograph, actually. That's a photograph of our main city street, O'Connell Street, and it's practically empty. So really what happened was everything Rail use fell off a cliff, went to drop by 97%, bus use reduced by 90% and car traffic was reduced by 70%. So there was massive decreases all across the board. As the restrictions eased, the transport capacity remained reduced to 80% and one, one fifth of the people that normally use public transport can now be accommodated with the physical distancing. So a couple of things. Um, happened to ensure that we had plenty to do that has kept us busy ever since. 
we, we basically identified a deficit in mobility because of this physical distancing on the public transport. And then also we ourselves, we changed the traffic signal settings to ensure that the uh, wait time for pedestrians was minimized, which meant that there was 30% less time for the private car to make their way around the city. So we made across the board, the city, much, much less wait times for pedestrians. If you combine that then with the uh, physical distancing requirements, you realize there's a massive of deficit there. So if you can't go by bus to work, which is what 50% of the people in, our, in Dublin do, what do you do? So we have a big challenge. Do we say it as an opportunity or do we see it as a threat? So is everybody going to literally barrel into their private car now? Or are we going to try and get them to start walking and cycling? So if you give me my next slide, thank you. We're looking at the potential. The first thing we did was to look at the potential changes in transport capacity. So you can see there the 2019 figures. Um, I won't go into every single line, but it's very clear there that uh, more than 50% go to work by public transport. We have a substantial number walking and an okay number cycling so far. And you can see there, there is still a, quite a substantial amount of people that travel to work by car. This is pre-COVID in our 2019 figures, which is a, a count that we do every November across all the entrances into the city core. Now, with the future, with, with the COVID pandemic, we looked at the potential changes in the transport capacity. And it was very clear with public transport and the uh, physical distancing requirements that the 80 percent of the people who normally travel by public transport will not now be doing so. So the actual capacity has been reduced to one fifth um, because of our um, traffic signaling um, tweaking, for want of a better word, the um, green time for cars is being reduced by 30 percent. So that's why that's a 30 percent reduction. And so it's a similar to taxis. And then therefore we we have decided to ambitiously state that we're going for a doubling of walking and a tripling of cycling to accommodate this deficit in public transport. So that is a challenge. So if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll explain where we started from. So uh, late April, early May, we developed a programme and it's titled Enabling the City to Return to Work. It's an interim mobility intervention programme from Dublin City. And we, we in Dublin City Council jointly produced this with the National Transport Authority. Now, what this document does is, is has developed a suite of mobility measures. It provides a framework for carrying out a suite of mobility measures both in the city centre core and in the top 15 routes into the city, in addition to the urban villages all around the, uh, beyond the city core itself. So all the urban villages within two kilometres, five kilometres and 10 kilometres of the city core. So we targeted, we targeted all of those. What are the suite of mobility measures? I'll very quickly read through them because they are important. Uh, increasing pedestrianised areas, so that's footpath width increases, increasing car free areas. Um, I spoke about this already, giving the pedestrians more green time at signal crossings. And we're also we are also developing contactless push buttons. We are reducing on street car parking spaces and loading bays. We are re removing them really and relocating them to create more space in the footpaths for pedestrians. We're looking at bus stops and we're looking at how we can queue safely at bus stops. And we have a number of very interesting trials under the way. And I'll talk about that further in the conversation. Um, we're putting across, across the city on the 14 key routes. So we identified what were the top routes for walking and cycling in cycling and we're basically targeting them in a priority basis based on the maximum first and installing protected cycle facilities the whole way in. Ardiana mentioned what, what makes people feel safe, certainly for cycling um, a segregated separation and we have lots of temporary uh, segregation um, being rolled out across the city. We have a number of areas we've put in contraflow cycling facilities as well. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the city more attractive for cycling and for walking. On the bus and bus priority, we're working with our partners in the National Transport Authority and we're looking at signalling where buses can get an early start. And we're also looking at areas where we can put in continuous bus lanes so that the public transport gets priority. We're also looking at possible bus rerouting in areas where there's high pedestrian footfall and indeed bus stop relocation. This will be done in consultation with the National Transport Authority and Dublin Bus. The other thing we've done is we have consulted with all our elected councillors uh, to 
put out a blanket reduction of speed limit across the city to 30 kilometres per hour. We've recently brought this to council and they have agreed to go to public consultation on this. This will make the city more attractive once again for cycling pedestrians and for vulnerable road users. We do recognise that will there will always be a demand for, for some sort of private car use, particularly for people with special needs or accessibility issues. And so we have stated that we will maintain access to existing car parks. The other thing as part of getting the city back to work is that we have a lot of requests for uh, uh, facilitating outside queuing, outdoor areas, outdoor furniture. That's all part of our suite of measures. We have appointed somebody, a particular team, to deal with businesses, um, optimising deliveries of goods and also optimising the, their outdoor space in front of their shops. Uh, I have a team appointed on the uh, communication side, more of that later, and that is to uh, develop this active travel promotion, which is getting those tripling of cycling numbers and the doubling of the pedestrians. And, and coupled with that, we also have a schools mobility programme that we're launching so that we're ready in September for that school gate and, and how do we get our children safely to school. So I just took some, some of the maps out from our, um, our programme. And this one, this very first one here in front of me, it shows you the city centre core and what we've identified there in yellow is the area that we will be calling the pedestrian, cycling and public transport priority zone. Now you may not be able to see it but it out of each, out of the city core there, we have the green lines which, which actually coincide with the 14 key radial routes. So there's routes into the city, there's the city core, and there'll be a suite of measures as I out, outlined earlier, unleashed on all of those. Next slide, please. Um, so you might say, well, God, that's a lot of work. So where do you start? Um, in fact, I think I'll stay in bed. It sounds like too much work. No. So what we did was we actually took the uh, cordon counts from last November, which is the counts across all the entrances in across the city, and we targeted um, the top corridors or routes, radial routes into the city for active travel, which is pedestrians and cycling. And straight away there on that graph, you can see that there's at least 10 of those that need, need intervention straight away. So starting with the very top one, we are currently, I have a suite of technical teams, I have four technical crews working on all these different routes, developing and designing interventions, including some of that suite of measures that I already indicated, which is the segregated cycle lanes, protecting them, footpath widths, removal of on-street parking, and all the measures I've just, uh, just uh, went through with you guys. So that gives you an idea of how we targeted where to go. That's on the routes into the city. In the city centre itself, just to add, we have targeted the areas with very high footfall. So just to give you an example, this is one of the maps that's in the appendix of the programme that I, that I talked about. And by the way, the programme is available online if anyone wants any further information. Please don't hesitate to contact me. So this is just one of the radial routes into the city. So for every single route, we looked at it and we looked at where we could make some interventions and where we could make interventions that would actually make it more attractive for active travel, which is the pedestrians and cycling, and also make some interventions to make it easier for the public transport uh, in addition. Next slide, please. In the urban villages themselves, we noticed, particularly during lockdown, when there was the uh, two kilometre uh, restrictions, uh, a lot of people were spending time in their own local areas. So there was a lot of busy um, urban villages. And by urban villages, I mean rows of shops um, in, in out beyond the city core. And uh, so what we did there was we identified uh, the key urban villages where were very busy footpaths, lots of queuing outside shops and where I would call it low hanging fruit or COVID light measures as we started to call them, whereby we could remove uh, either on street pay and display car parking or indeed loading bays, relocate loading bays to facilitate, as you could see two examples there in the photograph, some increased area for people to move around. Uh, on the cycling front, we have carried out a suite of measures and we're, we're, it's ongoing and active and, and will be so until, as Rihanna said, uh, a, a cure is found or a vaccine for the uh, pandemic. So we can't just say to people, oh, we want 300% increase in cycling unless we're actually going to provide them with, with something attractive and something that they feel safe in. So this example here will just show you, we've put a contraflow cycling lane in there. It's on Nassau Street. And you can see if you 
helped stare really hard there at those um, mini shergans. We've actually put in uh, lane delineators there and uh, the feedback so far has been very good. And indeed, we've done this in about 20 locations across the city where we've actually delineated the space where the cyclists can operate in and they are outside the traffic lane. And the feedback so far has been very good on that. This is another example of a cycle lane. This is actually one I use every day myself going into work. And this example I've put in to indicate we use this where we where there is no access to the curb side. That's a, a fairly a solid structure there. It's um, you can't drive over it and, you know, bin trucks can't pull in or deliveries. So cyclists feel very safe in this location. But there are some locations where we have put in the other type. Uh, this is my favourite place in Dublin. It is in front of Trinity and the Bank of Ireland. Uh, it's called College Green and we've done some lovely work there. So in some parts of the city, we haven't just put in uh, lane delineators or plastic bollards. We've actually put in some nice planters. Uh, as you can see there, that's very effective and it separates the cyclists once again from the vehicular traffic. So on the act of travel promotion, and we have a lot of that in the program, I just don't have time today to get to, to get hugely into it, but I did feel it was important to show you this drawing because this indicates, um, I suppose, the core messages of the program, which is that we have identified uh, the urban villages. You see there the city centre, and we've created a number of zones. First zone there is two kilometres. The next one is five kilometres, and then the, the next one beyond that is 10 kilometres. And what we've done is we've identified uh, in each of the zones, the different urban villages or population clusters. So an ordinary Joe Soap reading this will say, oh, look, I live in uh, Dolphin's Barn. Never knew it was just less than five kilometres in. Do you know, I might try cycling or walking that. So it's really to give the public uh, clear messaging um, to say, listen, if you live within two kilometres, obviously walking is a, or cycling is an option. Within five kilometres, walking and cycling. Um, greater than 10, you might consider cycling or public transport. What we're trying to do here is to free up the public transport capacity uh, so that the people who live quite close to the city can use active travel modes and so that the capacity of the, the reduced capacity of public transport is available for the people who really need it. Uh, I mentioned earlier on the bus stop trials and build outs. So this is a couple of examples. Um, so uh, we've done three trials in total. One was this morning, so I didn't have it in this presentation, but this was the very first one. Uh, this is quite a busy road and this is, I must call it almost like an IKEA style uh, modular bus build out. And um, what we did was we invited the accessibility groups to come and trial this. And we worked with Dublin Bus and the accessibility groups to see, does it work? Can it work? If you're in a wheelchair, is this a good way? You can see in terms of drainage, this is a very straightforward and that's why it's advantageous in that you don't have to do any major construction. It's almost like a flap over the existing drain and, and there's the structure as you see it. Now, the results that were quite mixed, I'll bring you to the next trial. This one is on Nassau Street. So this is trial number two. So you can see the existing footpath. And, and then from there, if you can see it in the photograph, we installed a temporary drain and we actually built out the footpath. You can see it there in the dark grey. And, um, and we put in that new curb that you see there with the black and the white and we similar to the first trial we got the buses to come up and invite the accessibility groups along I think there's another photo of this if you move on we invited the uh, accessibility groups to come along and trial it those um, shurgans they're the the awkward and the shurgans that you can actually see there you can actually drive over some of those uh, lane delineators which which does have its advantages if there's um, some 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 deliveries or some uh, bin truck collection that's just an aside you can see there um, I'm actually standing on that um, temporary uh, footpath uh, during that trial there and that one was successful and it had mixed uh, reviews. I can share some photos of the one today as well uh, by email if you want because each time we did the trial we listened to the feedback and it's got better and better and in fact the one we did today in College Green has been greeted with resounding success across all the accessibilities. Now just to move along on the uh, business and communication side of my COVID mobility team um, we have a, a full team that's um, 
basically involved in all the liaison with retailers, uh, communication, keeping the website updated regularly with an active social media campaign, because you cannot just have a report and leave it sitting in a cupboard. You obviously need to get out there and to get those messages out there that we're sharing the road space with care. We need guys who can cycle and walk to get walking and cycling. Um, we've set up uh, an actual public forum, which invites people to make comments and put in requests in their areas or, or where, where they feel that COVID mobility intervention May, may happen. And in actual fact, since I put in this slide, that has actually gone to a 980 requests from the public to date. So there's a lot of work there. We set up a, a website, as I say, we have a generic email. We're very busy with all of that. And I guess I just want to say to conclude, we have two sides of the house, if you like. I'm leading the COVID mobility measures. My right hand is the technical team that's delivering a suite of technical measures across the city. And on my left hand, I have the business and communication side, both working together, both really important. But the advantage of having the business and communication side um, is that the actual technical teams can get out there, get moving and get working on what they need to be doing. Because obviously this COVID mobility is, um, is something that won't last forever. The interventions, we feel probably the next 12 to 18 months are critical. So we need to just keep moving on it. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't speak too quickly. <laughs> Anyone, any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I, I was muted myself. Thank you very much, Patricia, for your presentation. Uh, you, you gave us more than 12 points. You gave us 12 measures. So very good and very inspiring. And uh, I don't know, Ariana, if we got more than 12 questions because I saw a lot of activity in the question box. So, Ariana, do you want to maybe open the questions and answers session? Now? Yes. Yeah. There are a few and a few are still coming, but I will start with um, two questions that are public transport related. Mm -hmm. So the first one is uh, if you are, um, I don't know, in Dublin, do you have more than one door on public transport or do you only have two, the front door? Two. Okay, so, and are, uh, are you opening also the back door then? Yes, so you're absolutely right. Now, I should clarify, uh, I suppose Dublin City Council's remit is to work in partnership with the National Transport Authority. So they would be more working with the, uh, they are the bus authority, if you will. So we're working with them in partnership, but I can answer questions on the bus in that we do have the two doors of the bus. Um, so there will be the front and that middle door. And you're right, there will be, uh, so there will be physical distancing measures on the public transport, including use of both doors. Okay. And uh, the, the second question is related also to public transport and uh, uh, Sylvia is asking, uh, do you know if uh, the, the um, windows in uh, metro, tram uh, and buses are being opened to uh, improve uh, air, air circulation in the vehicles? Yes, I don't know personally about the window situation. I have travelled on the uh, public transport and I see that the windows are open currently, but um, I know I'd have to check that because it's, as I say, uh, Dublin City Council, uh, it would work with the NTA on the specifics of the bus, but we're not the bus authority per se. So um, that would probably be a question more for the National Transport Authority, to be honest. Okay, and then uh, Jake from Bristol is asking, what approach has there been to engaging with the public over the new measures, if at all? Oh God, yes, we have a, a full team engaged on the communication of the new measures. So, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, we have uh, a website set up and we're actually doing weekly updates of every measure that we have um, implemented across the city. We're also keeping our elected members um, because it's very important to have their support. Uh, we're keeping them updated by weekly bulletins that we actually emailing them out to all the councillors. So for members of the public, we're updating the website and we have a very good and very uh, active communication with the public through social media and through the um, special email that we've set up. And also we have this special request form on site, which is unbelievably busy with requests, uh, multiple requests actually coming in per request. So the citizens are engaging with this. Thank you, Patricia. I have uh, uh, one question uh, that when you were showing the slide with the active travel promotion and this uh, showing how the distances are really um, how they are really. Yes, in the, the, city, the zones, the zone. The map, zones yes. and uh, what can you reach in five kilometers? Yes. What can you reach in and so on? And I was thinking, is it if um, is this indicated uh, on the street with signals? 
Um, do they do you get this information while cycling? Okay, because obviously uh, this is a live program that literally has just been produced in May um, and it's a phenomenal amount of work to be done in it. Um, I suppose what we're doing at the moment is we're concentrating on the softer side of that, which is a social media campaign, a targeted cycle, uh, get people back cycling campaign uh, in terms of on the softer side. So in terms of physical infrastructure in the street, that's not there yet, but that's not to say that we won't be doing it. It's mm -hmm. just that we're, we're we're busy doing lots of other stuff right now uh, in terms of resources because we're prioritizing. Uh, today was the uh, lifting of another set of restrictions in Dublin, actually. TV cameras were everywhere in town today because actually um, people are starting to come back in. So we have to target areas with high footfall to make sure that there's the physical space for them right now. But I do, I do appreciate the point you're making. I think going forward, and this is, as I say, a live program, that is something certainly that we, we could consider. Absolutely. Um, and as part of our cycling promotion campaign. On, uh, on that, I mean, uh, since it's uh, social media based, um, I uh, thought that uh, it could be useful to make this link uh, with environment and health uh, also evident in that. So saying, you know, if you would cycle for this 10 kilometers or five kilometers, yes. you get your daily amount of physical activity or you are saving, uh, I don't know how much CO2. And I think this could help in, in str strengthening this narrative that we are trying to create. You're so spot on, Ariana. In actual fact, we are already on to that because we're partnering with, as part of our campaign on the uh, business and communication side, we're going to partner or piggyback, if you like, with our colleagues in health and in environment because it's a threefold um, uh, gain. You've got the uh, advantages of your, your mental health, your physical health, and then you've got the environment as well as the safety of physical distancing being ensured. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pluses to active travel. And yes, you're right that all those partners are very important going forward. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, I think we can take one last question. Yes, while um, you were speaking, Ariana, Jake uh, from Bristol was uh, maybe wanted to say something further. Maybe we can invite uh, Jake to uh, uh, put uh, the microphone on to unmute himself and uh, he can ask directly the question to, to Patricia. So we make this uh, Jake. Good yeah. afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, just really impressive what's happening in Dublin. So, yeah, excellent work. Um, Thanks, I'm Jake. To know, um, in Bristol, we've seen a really big drop off in through traffic through the city centre, despite that being the focus of most of our initial measures. And I think now we're sort of perhaps shifting to more sort of neighbourhood and um, local measures, point closures, that sort of thing. Yes. Is that a similar conversation going on in Dublin or not? Oh, yes. So, um, so just to explain, um, on the technical, my technical team, um, I've actually split it in four. So we have uh, City North, City South, uh, City South Urban Villages and City North Urban Villages, because actually it's all of it that's really important. And um, we've recognised that because, yes, it's really important to free up the space in the city centre. But actually those urban villages, um, they're just as important. And, and that's what people want to see. People in their own localities want to see all those interventions. So we've tried to carry carry all of it at the one time by, by splitting it in that sort of way and it has worked well because you're getting the uh, good feedback from the urban villages which pleases the local councillors let's be honest as well in addition to um, the city centre which benefits everybody anyone who wants to come into town and let's face it we have to all make our city centres attractive so that one people will go back into the city centres to to uh, to the retail and shops and get people back back in back spending money so city centres are, are, are places that have to be um, prioritised but also it's definitely the case in Dublin we've also prioritized urban villages uh, does that answer your question yeah that's really helpful it was so similar similar to us then we have to prioritize everything at the same time same time unfortunately <laughs> it is that and it is a question of throwing the kitchen sink at it in terms of resources staff we're exploiting you know anyone with a pulse that can help us at this stage is being drafted in Nice to see, Jake, uh, Patricia, that you are having an actual dialogue, an actual city dialogue. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patricia, for no your contribution. And Thank it was, you very much. It was fantastic to be here. Thank you.
thank you. Uh, stay with us if you can still, because we still have two more experts uh, to talk about uh, their solutions, uh, how to go this back to new normal, or back to normal is not a solution, how they are building a new narrative. Uh, in uh, Rome, uh, we are going now to, to Rome, Enrico Stefano is the chairman of the transport uh, committee at the uh, Rome City Council and uh, they are uh, basically um, implementing the, 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 the speeds at which they are implementing the, the sustainable urban mobility plan has been speed up uh, due to the arrival of uh, COVID-19 to, to our lives. Uh, so it could be very interesting to know the links between uh, sustainable urban mobility plans and uh, the current situation. Good afternoon, Enrico. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to, to everybody. Thank Could you very you much. Please, uh, tell us yes. a bit more about your plans, about uh, yes. your new narrative in, in Rome. Go ahead. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm very happy to be here today with you, also because I totally agree with uh, the words back to normal is not the solution. I, we, we believe this in Rome, we are trying to uh, improving uh, our changing. We are uh, trying to boost the, the new infrastructure that we, uh, that we defined on the, on the sustainable urban mobility plan. Mm -hmm. So here you have your my presentation. Okay. Your presentation okay. is okay. If you can uh, okay. already take yes. over control. Okay, I push on, take the control. Okay. There you go. Okay. We are all Perfect. Here. Okay. Thank you very much. As, he, as you see on the first slide, I always uh, uh, mention, uh, as you can see, I'm a politician, I'm a decision maker, but uh, every time I'm mentioning on my presentation, also the, uh, our experts that support us to make the decision. We have a, a, a public company uh, owned by the city of Rome that support us to make the decision. Is a Rome Mobility Service. You see the name uh, Stefano Blinchi, Fabio Nussio, Francesco Iacorossi. Every time I mention them because they support us to, to, to change our city and is not uh, is not uh, easy so uh, and as we before uh, everything started with the sustainable urban mobility plan we we are proud of this uh, because we how can I see we did the homework uh, and and so uh, the last year we approved our our sustainable urban mobility plan it is a very, a very ambitious, a very ambitious uh, plan. Uh, we approved last year after uh, two years of uh, uh, of a long journey, a long path uh, with uh, many, many meetings. Uh, live on the website with the citizen, we uh, took, we uh, exchange experience with citizen to to make a sustainable urban mobility plan that was participated and uh, that uh, respond to the. Uh, uh, to the questions of the of the citizens, as you can see, our sample is it's very important because uh, we uh, believe in a, a multi-sectorial approach. You can see uh, there are many topics: uh, public transport, cycling mobility, pedestrian mobility, sharing mobility. Also, uh, also in these days in Rome, we are doing a lot on sharing mobility because we think that it, is, it could be very important to support the uh, the traditional uh, public public transport. So the city logistics, all safety. So we uh, worked on these uh, topics that are all linked. Uh, that are that are all linked. In uh, the next slide, you can see just uh, uh, some uh, bullet points of the uh, sample scenario. What we uh, we uh, are planning to do in Rome in the next uh, in the next uh, ten years. That is the time of uh, of the sustainable urban mobility plan. An extension of public transport network, uh, in particular, uh, uh, new underground metro and railways plus uh, 45 kilometers. And then uh, also we are uh, trying, uh, we are going to uh, realize also a couple ways for 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 the for the citizen, not not for holidays, but to uh, to move the people around the city. Also the tramway, we we strongly believe in. in To, to build in Rome because you know in Rome there are archaeological sites so sometimes the, the underground it's not easy to, to build also if it, if it is an opportunity uh, because we are doing uh, many many stations that are a museum but so it, the tram we, we strongly believe in tram because are, are very are, uh, it's easier to, to build it and also we are working to reduce the impact 
of the of the private car adoption of the C40 protocols we are uh, working on uh, uh, realizing one urban area with zero emission also we are working on a pollution charge more or less like the uh, congestion charge and uh, uh, we are uh, um, we are building all the, all the gates for this uh, pollution uh, pollution charge also a very important uh, a very important topics is uh, developing of cycling and pedestrian mobility uh, also because uh, i always said in in rome more than a half of the journey every day are a short journey so we believe that citizen can uh, can walk can cycle because uh, uh, for for the short journey is is the best uh, is for uh, for everyone and in particular now with the uh, covid uh, emergency and last but not least the, as uh, i said before the developing of sharing and e mobility in particular for the sharing mobility we have a, a very uh, ambitious plan we have a, a framework that it's very easy for the company to to start uh, a service we have many services of car sharing of uh, bike sharing now we started also with the scooter sharing it's it's a very important uh, uh, topics that we think it's it's important also because it can support the uh, traditional public transport uh, system uh, in the next slide you can see the uh, our target for we want to a sustainable urban mobility plan today unfortunately we are uh, more than a half uh, the 63% of the uh, journey that are made with private uh, private cars or or private uh, um, or private uh, uh, scooters and so and the sustainable modes are just the uh, 37% uh, 37% we want to in the sum scenario uh, scenario uh, reach a target of half and half more or less more more or less that it's very important for us because uh, it's important the congestion, as we said before, not only for uh, reduce the pollution for uh, the health benefits, but also because we believe that uh, moving with a sustainable modes is important to uh, boost our our economy, in particular local economy, local shops. And every time that I talk about uh, sustainable mobility, also I want to underline these these points that we think it's uh, it's very important because we also boost our economy, and we know that now it's very important with a sustainable sustainable mobility. In uh, the next slide, you can see. Yes, the uh, the effects of, of the lockdown. We. Uh, did in the last months uh, several measures to uh, to check how the city uh, changed during the lockdown and also to uh, to take uh, uh, important lesson from the lockdown. Um, I see more or less the number are the same in in all uh, in all the city, but I I want to uh, explain also the the numbers in uh, in Rome. We reduced the taxi service. We reduced the public transport during the lockdown, the service that was suspended at 9 uh, p.m., uh, the limited traffic zones and also the on-street parking were, uh, were suspended. And we uh, took also a very interesting uh, initiative of benefit, for example, uh, 100 car sharing uh, free for the health workers. And then we uh, opened a dedicated website that is it's still online, uh, uh, as you can see uh, at the bottom of, of the chart. Uh, on, this web, uh, on this website, every day we, uh, we show the numbers of the city about congestion, about uh, uh, traffic, uh, cars, and, and so on. And so so every, everybody, every citizen can see the numbers of, uh, of Rome. These are, as I said before, the lessons that we learn, and uh, I think that are very important lessons for, for our uh, still now, and we want to uh, boost the smart working, because it's important to reduce the, the journey, reduce the, the moments in, in the city, and uh, the smart workings, at the beginning we, we had a little difficult also in the public and the private sector but then after the initial difficulties we, we have positive feedbacks uh, in the public sector in the private sector i work with the network of mobility manager in rome that are uh, they that are workers from from in, in, in all the city and workers uh, give us a positive 
we want to uh, to uh, go go ahead with the smart working because it's a good solution also for productivity also for benefits for the for the workers obviously we uh, see a strong reduction of the high pollution a further increase of interest about uh, bicycles in these days in rome but not only in rome in italy uh, we can see a queue to the bike shop because uh, people want to buy uh, new bicycles. There is uh, an increase of interest in, uh, in bicycles. This is very, very uh, important. Uh, obviously, we uh, see an increase of fear to use the public transport uh, due to sanification problem, difficult to maintain social distancing. This is uh, today still a problem with the public uh, with the public transport. As I said, sharing mobility, uh, we are working to improve the service and guarantee uh, the uh, sanification for, for the users. And uh, this is a very important point about the public space. I think that now the lessons, the most important lesson that we are uh, learning from uh, COVID emergency is that the public space is important. We have to use uh, properly the, the public space. Uh, and uh, I'm happy because many citizens uh, sent me pictures of the square of the streets without cars. And I said, Mr. S a square, um, a road without cars is uh, uh, more beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, there is a more quality space. It's more attractive. It's safer. And so we want to uh, improve, and we want to going ahead on this uh, on this uh, approach. Uh, then the second phase, back to the future, reopening the city. These are just. Um, a few dates in uh, in, in Italy. We uh, start. Uh, uh, we we finish the lockdown at the beginning of May. Uh, the most important activities reopened in uh, in the mid of uh, of May, and then in, at the beginning of June of June we uh, we keep moving around the regions in uh, in Italy. And now uh, we are uh, going to move also in, a, in other in other country, and the, um, the school are closed until uh, September. So we we still have time to to improve our network, our network, our um, mobility solutions. Reopening the cities, as I said, uh, it's it's very difficult uh, for the public transport because the safe condition, uh, uh, social distancing, is very hard to maintain uh, on a bus on an underground. Uh, anyway, we mark position where people can stay on board of board the, the buses, sitting on uh, alternative place. The capacity was reduced to 50 percent, with uh, and the passenger have to wear. Uh, safe mask when they take a bus or underground. We are working with our company to guarantee extra cleaning, but it's it's not easy. And uh, we are uh, improving uh, the number of trips on on buses line, but also it's it's not easy because you can't double uh, the fleet of of, of a public transport in, in a few weeks or in a few in a few months. Uh, we saw in the first days a decrease of the use of the public transport about the 80. Uh, percent. This is a, a very important issue. It's it's uh, it's a very big problem also because uh, uh, the company uh, um, uh, has a, a less revenues because they don't sell the the tickets. So this is also a very important problem from a financial uh, point of view. Then about cards, we ex are extended the the sharing system. Still working on the smart working that is confirmed also in uh, in this uh, in these months and also in these next months. We are uh, also working for different uh, city hours to opening uh, the shops or the office in different uh, times to avoid the, the rush hours. The uh, limited traffic zone are, are still open. There is a big debate in Rome about this, but we um, we mm, the, the on street parking is is again subject to to payment. Also about freight. We are working with the uh, we in the SAMP with the uh, living lab uh, with university with operator to uh, improve the, the freight uh, the freight system. Then the uh, we are very proud of this the implementation of uh, transition cycle lane uh, uh, cycle lane uh, plan. It's a very ambitious uh, plan of about 150 uh, kilometers, and uh, we are uh, building the first uh, 40 kilometers plus other uh, other uh, uh, bike lanes that uh, was uh, planned before the COVID, and now we are uh, 
uh, we, it are under construction. As I said, we strongly believe on, uh, on walking and cycling because more than uh, an half of journey every day in Rome are short journeys, so are below five kilometers and is the perfect distance to be covered by walk or cycling or, or no, together with, uh, with, the public, uh, with the public transport. Also, we are working on a, strong, on a strong communication package based on the experience of Via Libera. In Italian, Via Libera is uh, uh, free roads, more or less. On some month, we, before the COVID, we closed a, a ring of a more, more or less uh, 20 kilometers in the city center to show to the citizen uh, the benefits of, uh, of uh, streets without, uh, uh, without cars. Now, just uh, uh, a few pictures of our of the bike lanes that we are uh, building. It's important because these bike lanes are, are all on the on the most important uh, streets, on the uh, most important roads. We are so we are reducing the spy the space for for private cars where where cars uh, take uh, the space every. Every time, this is a, a, an important uh, road in uh, in Rome, Via Tuscolana. That it's uh, it's very big uh, from from the neighborhoods to the to the city center. We want to give a, a message. Uh, bicycles are uh, a vehicle, and so uh, need the more or less not the same space of the cars, but the same rights to be in uh, in the in the principal roads like uh, like cars. So this is also very important for the road safety because we are reducing the space for, for the private cars, also they reduce the speed. And so, uh, for example, for, the, for, for a pedestrian, it's easier to, uh, to, cross, uh, to cross the road because it, it's shorter than the space to, to cover. Uh, then another, another picture, here we are in the city, of Ro in the city center. This is still uh, via, via Tuscolana. You, you can see the ancient uh, Roman ruins and the reducing. It's improving the space, uh, a bike lane, but also you can see this, uh, in, in these points, the, the pedestrian, uh, it's easier for us to, to cross the roads because uh, there is less, uh, less space to, to cross and more visibility. So, the lessons that uh, we don't forget, we are continuing in the website that I, that I said uh, that I said before. Uh, also, we are still working with mobility manager because it's important to uh, integrate the mobility system also with the company, with public and private company, uh, for example, with different uh, different times uh, uh, to open, so to avoid the rush hours. Smart working and digitalization, as uh, I said, this is a, stru a structural revolution and it's not just a passenger phenomenon. So we are uh, strongly believe in smart working and better regulation of city timing, as I said, active modes. Uh, it's important to increase uh, pedestrian and walking modes. And uh, uh, last but not least, pollution and climate change. Uh, I think now is the time for cities to leading the change because we spent in the cities most uh, time of our lives. So it's important to change our cities improving uh, sustainable modes, uh, sustainable mobility to avoid also future crises like uh, climate uh, uh, change. So I finish. This is my contact and thank you very much for, for, for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Enrico. Thanks for your presentation. Very complete. Uh, I saw that some people were asking questions uh, during your presentation, so now is the, is the moment. You can use the tool, uh, raise your hands if you want to say something directly. Otherwise, I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Ariana to be back with me, back, back with us. Ariana, can you? Yes. Yes, I can see um, you, but I cannot see you, but uh, please go, go ahead. Okay, so we have uh, again uh, a few uh, public transport related uh, questions. Um, in this case, uh, someone is asking, do you think that if it's uh, more of a feeling of unsafety or rather the real danger of infection? <laughs> uh, and I think this is a big discussion that is uh, still very open. There are very contradictory messages. Yes. Wearing a mask is enough, wearing a mask is not enough. You also need to keep the social distance. So what is the approach in, in Rome concerning this question? Yes, this is. I think this is a, a, a very hard question. 
just a few a few days ago, I was reading a, um, an article o, o, on the website that uh, explained that uh, maybe I don't know the public transport is not so dangerous for for the for for the COVID uh, pandemic. I don't know. We are trying to to do uh, as much as possible. We um, we are running daily sanification of of the buses uh, of the underground. We are trying to uh, improve the the number of, of trips of the public transport. As I said, it's not easy because uh, uh, you can double the the, the, the fleets of of of, uh, of our company, but we are trying to do uh, as as much as possible also monitoring the the busiest uh, lines to 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 improve it uh, i don't know we we are trying to to do the best maybe we we can uh, we will have the the right uh, um, answer in the next uh, in the next weeks uh, here in rome we are we are trying to to protect uh, as much as possible our citizen Thank you, Enrico. Um, yeah, from, from what we have seen also in previous uh, city dialogues, uh, the, the approach is uh, similar. It's, uh, it's really focusing on uh, um, improving also the feeling of safety of the passengers. So some operators are showing the cleaning yes. procedure. So uh, that we are that's... doing the same on the social network. Uh, our public company uh, show when they uh, clean a uh, buses or underground. We we are we are trying to to do as much as possible to 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 avoid uh, a panic on, on the use of public transport. I think that we can use the public transport, but with all the uh, particular needs like uh, uh, safe mask, gloves, uh, and so. Thank you. And uh, the other, another difficult question <laughs> is, uh, is the extension of the metro network mm. being reconsidered uh, in light of the crisis? Yes, as, as I said on the SAMP, on the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan, we we planning for, for the next uh, 10 years are improving of more or less uh, 45 kilometers of, of underground. In Rome, in Rome, it's not easy. Uh, to build new underground, sometimes for the archaeological uh, archaeological problem, but I think the archaeological problem sometimes are also an opportunity. We are building a wonderful uh, station in the city center that are more or less a free museum. You, you, you take the underground, but you see also the the, the, the ruins that we discovered uh, during the construction. But also it's very difficult because Rome um, as um, um, like. Like, for example, I always say in, in Rome we have the, the same uh, extension of London, but we have uh, a third of population. So it's not easy to uh, build a new underground because uh, in, in Rome the sprawl, the urban sprawl, is it's a very big problem. And so sometimes you have uh, citizens that are sprawled in, in in the city. It's not easy to, to reach with an underground because you know you, that underground needs a, has a, a big capacity. So uh, from a demographic point of view, um, if you have a if you have a, if you have not concentrated the, the population, it's it's harder to 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 reach with an underground. So um, this is a problem in Rome. Anyway, we are improving our our network. As I said in in, uh, in the sample, we are uh, finishing the the third line of underground, and we are planning to build the fourth line of uh, underground in uh, in Rome. Thank you very much. We have a few other questions, but I will try to keep them for the final discussion. Okay. Uh, if we speed up a bit, uh, maybe we can have a, a bit of a discussion at the end. Okay. Thank you very much, Enrico, thank for you. being thank with you us. Very much. Good, thank you, Enrico. Thank you, Ariana, also for bringing some of the questions. And as, as you said, we will have a bit more time uh, by the end of this city dialogue. But uh, before, we need to say hello to our last uh, speaker, our last expert, Chris Van Barui. She's a project leader at Smart Ways to Antwerp. Good afternoon. Goedemiddag, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. So indeed, uh, the trips that we do to go to work, so commuting to work is one of the most or uh, the biggest part in the shed of uh, daily trips in our daily lives uh, that we so reduce, actually. And uh, you are working in Antwerp with uh, companies. Can you please... Uh, Tell us a bit more. Here's your presentation. Please, the floor is yours to tell us okay. a bit more about your projects. 
Um, I will start with some, some facts and figures about Antwerp. Um, Antwerp has uh, more than half a million inhabitants. It's located in the center of Europe and it has the second large port of Europe. So that's to explain we have lots of commuters. Um, the region in Antwerp is also confronted with big major road congestions. And on top of that, we are planning to have several major constructions works, construction works. So that's why in 2016, Smart Ways to Antwerp was created as a project team to limit the hindrance through soft measurements. And within this uh, project team, uh, we created also um, as a cooperation model within Smart Ways to Antwerp, we created the marketplace for mobility. And the marketplace for mobility actually works uh, with three target groups, which actually are the customers that go into the market, that are the employers and employees. We have a team which we call the employers approach. We approach companies to help them to convince employees to travel at a different time, travel differently or travel more efficiently. We also have a, a team who work around residents and visitors and another team around logistics. What do we offer them? We offer them in the first place information. We have a website, we are active on social media, um, we have newsletters so people keep up to date with the roadworks and with, and with what's happening in Antwerp. We also uh, have our own uh, travel planner who also offers combined traveling. So we have in one trip, uh, we can combine different different modes of transportation. So that's something new that Google or other travel travel planners don't have. And then next to that, we have our mobility products. We have all our mob existing mobility products, which we want to make known to the travelers. But now we come to the core of the marketplace. We also want to have no new smart solutions. And that's why in the end of 2017, we had a big event uh, with everybody who means something in, in the mobility world to, world to convince them to build with us together the marketplace. So you ha can have the next slide now. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is an example of our own shared mobility bikes, which are very popular. The next, please. Next. Yeah. So, then I come to the new smart solutions and I um, we had this big call to everybody, to all the private sector to help us to set up the marketplace. So that was in 2016. If we now see the next slide. Uh, the idea is to have as much as possible to create partnerships as much as, as possible with the private sector, government private sector, but also private partnerships between private partners themselves. So um, we have two kind of partnerships. We have a, a simple partnership, which actually is the partnership light, you could call it also, uh, because we created some uh, big uh, brand awareness of smart ways to end work of our logo. These partners, when they have um, a service uh, that's good quality and um, that helps the reduction of cars. They can use our logo and they also get a place on our website and get mentioned in newsletters. So that's the simple partnership, but we also have partnerships through project calls. So then we work more closely together and they also get, get some financial support. So since September 2016, we already have 130 simple partners and we had three general project calls. So we have uh, we had more up to 80, almost up to 80 project proposals and we have 44 uh, project partners. We had one, th these were general project calls, so every, every kind of service which had good quality and who could prove they had a reduction of car usage, they could enter. We had one thematic um project call and that was for mass because we strongly believe in Antwerp that mobility as a service is also a, a good solution. That was last year, but now in March this year we have a new problem, a new challenge, and that's um, 
the, 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 the crisis and now people are getting back to work and now we really want to avoid that they all take the car instead of PT or instead of shared mobility. PT, public transport, people are afraid, so that's perhaps not a solution. That's why we are really now looking for other solution to convince commuters to travel differently. <clears throat> and that's why we, we really strongly believe in, in this marketplace. We, on the one hand, we want to increase the demand by um, really getting people, in this case commuters or travelers, to get to know what's on the market, what is the choice that I can make. And on the other hand, we want to stimulate the offer. We have all these mobility providers, share, share mobility providers, who really had a, a difficult time now, and we want to go back to market. We want to, we want to make their offer well known and we want to connect both. So we also want to do this um, So with these partnerships that we know from our marketplace. So what kind of proposals do we want? We want qualitative, qualitative reliable and smart mobility solutions or offerings for companies, for work-related travel, work-to-work -to -work travel or movements between workplaces. And we want uh, trial offers. We want road low threshold trial offers, temporary offers, which we, what, that people can easily uh, try and afterwards can become more durable. <clears throat> and we want them to have a direct positive, it's too quick, go back one, yeah. We want it to have a posi positive impact on the mobility context in Antwerp in the short, but then also in the long term. That's very important. We also want an effect in the long term but you want them to be implemented in the short term. So now the next, please. Um, so we want this to our simple partnerships. Um, par partners, services or companies that already are our partner can additionally, through our website, there's an addition button which they can use to make their renewed or trial offer known. So that's very easy, low threshold, existing companies, we know them, we have more than under 30 parties, partners, when they have, when they want to do something special now, some offering, they can easily make it known. We have a, a big, a quick conversation, we see if it, we know them, we see if it's uh, good quality, and then we can make it known by the at the company. So that's one kind of partnership. I also put uh, a link with our website if you want to have, learn more about it. It's in English, you can re read it uh, using the link also. And then uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, this is an example, or this is all our uh, 130 mobility partners. Next slide, please. And then we also have our project called B2B, we called it. Um, uh, there we want to also want a good uh, trial offer. And what do they get instead? Uh, we will make their services feasible and noticed it. We also uh, give them access to the network of companies participating our employers approach. So this, these are more than uh, 100 companies and up to 50,000 employees that they can reach that way. And we w introduce them as a quality, a good quality service. Uh, they also get everybody that uh, fills in a proposal gets feedback from a jury, a jury, a jury of professionals. Even if, if the if the proposal isn't selected, they get to know why and they can learn from it. Also, the selected ones they, that pro pro participate, uh, they have to, we monitor them, we have a close cooperation and we also ask the companies for feedback so they really can learn about this. Uh, so that's the active support from Smart Ways to Antwerp. Next to that, they get a financial support no, you're too quick. One, they get a financial support of um, maximum 50,000 euros, um, which is linked, no cure, no paid. So we really have to see results. And we really want to that this money is used 
uh, maximum used as a cashback to the users. So um, to have a, a really low threshold offer, which is very cheap, cheap for the employers. Next, please. So here, once again, I, I put uh, the, um, the link for more information and a, sprint screen, a print screen of how to submit a project proposal, which is very easy. They have to read the guidelines. Of course, we have um, a selection criteria, which they have to follow. They have to fill in the form and um, they have to fill in a proposal before the 3rd of August. Next, please. So here we have uh, the selection criteria. We have three big selection criteria, impact, quality, and the extent to which the city support is requested. Uh, very important for us is, is the cashback, that the money is well spent, that it's long lasting, durable, and uh, that there's a commitment of the parties involved. The next, please. So that's the, the last slide. Uh, we really believe in, in joint for, uh, forces and that's uh, all our team members of Smart Ways to Antwerp. Thank you. Big team, thank yeah. you very much, Chris. Thank you. Sorry, I was challenging you with, uh, with the slides. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we, we have now time for questions and answers, not uh, only directly to you, but also for the rest of the speakers because it's, just, it's uh, only 15 minutes left uh, to... Uh, close this city dialogue. Aliana, I see you are already there. Yes, um, I uh, didn't receive any uh, specific question to Chris, but I will uh, take this occasion to ask uh, one myself. Um, so the, the reason why you are uh, focusing strongly on uh, B2B and on uh, uh, this partnership with, with businesses and companies um, and on this uh, trial offer, I think it has well-rooted um, uh, reasons into the behavior change and into the fact that when the context people live in change uh, importantly, like uh, moving to a new uh, house, changing job, having kids, uh, or in this case, the COVID pandemic, they are more prone in taking up different uh, um, or trying different mobility behaviors. Was this the reasoning? Yeah, that's, that surely was the reasoning. So lots of people had to stay home come back to work now, it's it's lovely weather. Um, they they are afraid, um, they don't have a car, lots of them. We, had, we had actually had a, a quite good model split already in Antwerp. So there are lots of commuters who didn't use their car and we are afraid that because um, congestion is a little bit less now, because still lots of people are working from home, we were especially afraid that people that went back would use their car. So we really want to avoid that. And we really want to ha have see that they have a choice of alternatives and not use the car. So that's the, the idea. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if anyone is interested in learning more on uh, how Antwerp did it, uh, please send me an email. I am happy to, to put you in touch with, uh, with Chris or to refer to their website. Good. Thanks, Ariana, for all your support, coordinating all the activities uh, that we are organizing at the Eurocities Mobility Forum. This City Dialogues is uh, just only one of those many activities you are, you are coordinating. We are getting to an end to our city dialogue, but before we still have some questions, uh, I remind you the basic rules. If you have one question, you can uh, write it in the in the chat box, or you can just even better simply raise raise your hands, and uh, the floor will be yours to ask your question to any of the three speakers or between you, Ariana. There was a, um, a question that was raised a bit before uh, for um, for both the speakers from uh, Dublin and Rome uh, mm -hmm. by Emir from in uh, Sarajevo. Um, so, so maybe we can we can ask uh, Enrico is back and Patricia if we can ask Patricia to be back as well to answer to this question. Sure. And, uh, uh, so Ariana. the question was, do you think that the transition of user from public transport to bicycles or scooters can jeopardize the long-term sustainability of public transport? If we take into account that the share of transport with private vehicles does not decrease. 
So basically, if people don't uh, stop using the car and if the people that change behavior are the ones that previously used public transport and now can that don't want to use public transport anymore, they switch to, to um, active modes. Uh, are this, uh, is this, uh, uh, let's say, a bad um, model shift? Will, will I start, Patricia from Dublin? Yes. Yes, please, um, Patricia, please. go ahead. I understand the subtlety of the question. Um, I, go, I guess as part of our COVID mobility uh, programme, uh, the key message that we, and we have lots and lots of people who live beyond, we call it that 10 kilometre zone. So I guess if you recall the uh, map I showed with the two kilometre, the five kilometre, five to 10, and then greater than 10. So the messages that we're putting out as part of the COVID mobility programme is to leave the capacity for the people who live uh, further out and who absolutely will need the public transport. Um, and so therefore, the people that live close to the city, they use the active travel modes. That's why we're in a COVID pandemic uh, situation. Going forward, um, the capacity of the public transport shouldn't be an is issue, certainly here in Dublin, because of the nature of, um, we're quite a low rise city. So um, there is, a, put it like this, plenty of customers for, for the buses uh, who, who are 10 kilometers and out. Um, and indeed, there are plenty of people who active travel is not an option. So they will continue to use the, um, the bus. We don't have actually an underground in Dublin so it's really um, the uh, public transport is uh, quite uh, it's it's mainly that the bus um, is is the main uh, way that people use to commute into the city but um, there is enough capacity uh, in the outer zones to service the, um, the the bus and indeed the people who can't use active travel but I do understand the subtle point um, we are in a pandemic though so I suppose at the moment we are in a, in a, um, a unique situation where um, active travel is suddenly become really safe you know so it is it is a it's a strange time but i do feel um i thought i saw did i see a quote that there's no such thing as uh, you know there's always an upside to, to pandemics and all these things so um in many ways it is an opportunity to take stock and relook at, at the way the city moves so we're, we're we're embracing it and putting a lot of energy into doing that right now i don't know enrico if you also want to uh, answer this question if you are still there. Yes. Do, yes. do you hear me? Yes. Okay. No, sorry, I, I had a little problem with my connection. I hope it's, now it's everything uh, right. Uh, about the questions to the transition of uh, users from public transport, in, I can uh, answer to, to this question. It's, it's okay for you. No, because yes, I yes. think uh, this is a very, very interesting question. In, in Rome, it's a little bit different because uh, as I show in, uh, in my presentation, we have uh, a very important numbers of people that still use the, the private cars. So um, we believe that these transitions could, uh, could move from the private cars to uh, a more sustainable model like uh, cycling and walking. And more or less, we can have, uh, um, we hope in the future, the, the same, the same um, citizens, commuters that use the, the public transport. So in Rome, because we started from a situation where the, the, the use of the private car is, is very heavy, I don't think this transition could be a problem from the public transport, for the public transport. Maybe in other cities it, it could happen. In Rome, I think no. But, but uh, sorry, could, could I could I just come back actually, Patricia yes. from Dublin, on that yes. as well because um, my Rome colleague has, has has reminded me of a very important point that I forgot to mention is that um, we're actually targeting our main. Um, focus of our promotion campaign to get people into active travel is actually to the people who are welded to their private cars. So the audience we're targeting mainly in the active travel. And when you look at my presentation, you'll see the number of private cars that are coming into the city. We also have that problem in Dublin where there is still a good cohort of people who think it's okay to drive into the city to work. So really we are targeting, if you remember my slide, the opportunity or threat, we are actually targeting uh, people who are welded to their private cars to to get out of their car and to consider active travel um, so that would be the primary i suppose target market of the people that we wanted to, the, to grow those numbers and those ambitious numbers of tripling or cycling and doubling or walking is actually it's the guy in the car the guy or the girl in the car you understand so that's our first um that's our first market group to target uh, okay 
I thank you for specifying. Sp thank, thank you for specifying that, Patricia. I think it's a uh, it's an important point, uh, and indeed the the, the focus uh, should be uh, mostly on the people that uh, used to drive uh, their car already pre-pandemic, um, and uh, on this. Um, how, what are the other options besides uh, uh, cycling and walking? There was a question for Rome uh, on uh, the new uh, e-scooters. Um, and uh, Silvia is asking, how do we make you sure that scooters won't block pedestrians and endanger accessibility for groups with special mobility needs? And that's a question directly for Enrico, right? Yes, yes. yes. I'm I have to be honest, in, in these days we have a little problems with the with these e-scooters uh, in Rome uh, with some conflicts with, with the uh, pedestrians and also with the public transport, uh, the stops of the public transports. We are doing, we are improving the, 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 the works with, with our uh, local police to reduce this impact. Also, we um, realized a, a framework of rules for the users, for the company of sharing that they have to move the, the scooters in, in a short time if the scooters, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, dangerous or it's blocking, I don't know, uh, pedestrian uh, access or, or something similar. We are improving this system uh, combined with the um, sharing company and the local police. We are having a little problem. I believe that we can uh, we can uh, resolve it very very quick. Thank you, very Enrico. Uh, from uh, what um, we have seen uh, last year, Eurocities did a lot of uh, work on uh, on e scooters, and uh, one of the solutions that we have seen uh, applied and now is getting a bit more widespread is a combination of uh, uh, geofencing for the uh, e scooter providers, so they can track where the obviously where the uh, scooter are parked. And uh, if you connect this with creating some simple um, lines, uh, like parking for e scooters uh, on uh, on street, uh, then you can really see that people tend to leave it more on these uh, uh, signed areas rather than leaving them on the on the um, sidewalk or wherever. So um, there there are some good practices in terms of these uh, parking spots that are quite uh, simple to to apply. Thanks, Adriana, for reminding us the, the work that we have done uh, uh, recently on, uh, on this, on this uh, burning issue, indeed. Um, Maybe yes, we can go to... Is there someone that raised their hand? No? I didn't see no. anyone. No. Okay. It's, uh, Maybe almost, we uh, can go to the question that we... Some of the other questions that we received from participants when they registered. Yes, uh, for example, from Stockholm, uh, Maria Angelina asks, uh, are there any examples and concrete actions to tackle increase in motorized individual transport? For example, incentivizing other modes through updated regulations, physical planning, etc. And uh, we also received more questions. Uh, Ariana, you can maybe read this one from uh, Julia. Yes. Um, what step can local authorities take to change embedded transport behaviors? So I think we try to reply also to to these questions during Big this challenge. Dialogue. Big challenge. Big challenges. But um, maybe one last point, which also to make the bridge between Rome and Antwerp. Um, Enrico, I know that, and you mentioned it during your presentation, this new figure of the mobility managers in, in company in Italy, which is not new, but now uh, companies with uh, le less uh, than, uh, with uh, only 100 employees uh, need to have it. Can you tell us a bit more about this uh, figure? Yes, this is a, a very good experience that we are uh, doing with, with these uh, figures. Mm, with the mobility manager, we, we, we see more or less uh, once a month and our expert also more. And we are trying to uh, improve the possibility, for example, for the large company to, to the access to the public transport or a dedicated, uh, um, dedicated uh, uh, bus service. Um, it's, it's very important because uh, it's a mix of uh, coordination in, in the company and of the action that we can uh, uh, do as a decision maker, a politician. And 
in in Rome in particular, I have to say it, now it's it's working uh, very well, thanks also in to this uh, this this crisis. But we we are lucky because we worked with the mobility measure also before the crisis, and so it, it's a work that we we still uh, we still had. Um, this is important. I think it, it's important because sometimes you can change just. A little habit for for the employees, for the workers, but the impact on on the city uh, system it, it's it's very important. So in, in Rome it's working very very well with, with the uh, politician, mobility managers, our engineer expert. It's a good combination. Thank you, Enrico. So maybe one last uh, chance. Uh, if you have uh, any other question, uh, this is the moment before uh, we otherwise close the city dialogue and say goodbye. Any thank raising hands? Not so far. I think the presentation were great. And uh, thank you very much to all the speakers uh, that were with us thank today. Thank you very much. Yeah, indeed. And thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Oh, thanks a million, everybody. It's lovely to talk to you thank all you. and hope to see you all in the real life soon. Indeed. Oh, hopefully. Thank you. Hopefully. Thank you. Hopefully. Bye. Thank you. See you. Take thank care. You. Bye bye. Thank you for joining. And please remind, uh, let me remind you that uh, uh, this is the last city dialogue before the summer break from for the mobility team, but it's still. Uh, we we are still open over the summer. Uh, during the summer, you can uh, still check the COVID news platform. Uh, you can uh, follow us on Twitter. We change our our handle. It's now at Eurocities, and uh, you can contact us at, at any time. This is uh, one uh, generic uh, email address, but of course, Ariana is your main contact point. So myself or any of the people that you saw at the beginning of this uh, meeting, the, our faces. The mobility team of the University of Brussels office is uh, all yours uh, also during the summer. So thank you very much for joining. See you, as Patricia said, see you hopefully uh, physically soon. Bye bye. Take bye. care. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Sir.